Hello, I'm Mark Watson, and I'm here to bring you a very special edition of the Comedy of the Week podcast. I hosted the BBC New Comedy Award 2017 live final up at the Edinburgh Fringe. Six of the best new comedy acts battled it out to be crowned winner with a special performance from Tez Ilias, and here it is for your listening pleasure. You can hear an exclusive interview with the winner after the programme. Enjoy the show. This is the live final of Radio 4 Presents the BBC New Comedy Award 2017. <laughs> Nearly 700 people applied and battled their way through heats around the country. Tonight, the final six will perform. The winner will receive a £1,000, a 15-minute script commission with BBC Studios Radio Comedy and a trophy. Um, which is, in fact, a bit rubbish. Uh, <laughs> it would have been better to structure that sentence differently, because the script commission is the most... Oh, the grand is worth having. Anyway, um, <laughs> look, winning is what it's all about. Uh, tonight, I, th this is in my script, is uh, not only in red, but underlined. Tonight is all about stand-up comedy. There is a possibility you may hear some strong language and adult humour. <laughs> if you've tuned in expecting almost anything else on Radio 4, you're in for a rough ride. Um, <laughs> One thing is for sure, everything you hear will be absolutely live. So I've been asked to make it clear that if you're offended by anything, um, there's, there's, there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll just have to suck it up. But, um, <laughs> oh, I nearly swore that. Not quite, though, when we're fine. Um, <laughs> but a real sort of high-wire act for me. So you can imagine what this is like for the comedians, many of them very... Well, all of them very inexperienced, just embarking on this career. This is a huge gig uh, for them. They can all hear me saying this as well. I'm not helping this situation. Uh, <laughs> Actually, very few situations where you'd have to do something quite as big as this. Uh, so a huge challenge, but also a huge reward for the six comedians. They will be judged by a uh, panel of comic luminaries over there. Please make them all very welcome. First of all, Radio 4's commissioning editor for comedy, Sean Ed Williams. Uh, Perry Award winner, Jenny Eclair. And the excellent comedy writer and performer, Hugh Dennis. Past finalists of this competition uh, include Peter Kay, Sarah Millican, and Lee Max. So the people you're going to hear tonight are the comedy stars of the future. Shall we meet our first act? Yeah! I was really banking on you to approve that. I've no doubt that you will give an enormous welcome. Will you please begin the welcome for the first act uh, gently, but then ramping it up quite quickly. <laughs> and welcome to the stage, Mr Andy Field. How exciting. Is this... I should do some jokes. Uh, I like to think the guy who invented the wardrobe and the guy who invented the hospital gown were rivals. Uh, that's the whole thing, come on. No. <laughs> uh, they had to present their inventions on the same day. It was like, all right, Dave, uh, you've made a wooden storage container for clothes. What's that called? Oh, it's called a wardrobe. <laughs> uh, <so laughs> Steve, you've made a robe to be worn on the ward in hospitals. What's that called? Oh, it's called, this is ridiculous, OK? <laughs> it's called, why does he always get to go first? <laughs> Hospital gown, leave me alone. <laughs> I like to think the guy who made the umbrella was going to call it the brella, but he hesitated. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good invention. What's this called? Umbrella? Umbrella. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> He's got to call up his wife, Mrs. Brella. Uh, <laughs> could not believe how wrong this has gone. <laughs> I've never been a small claims court. I'd like to imagine it's a bunch of people stood around going like, oh, I can drink a can of Coke in five seconds. <laughs> I've got two cats. <laughs> I've been to Spain. <laughs> Sounds great. I'd love to be invited sometime. <laughs> I like to smoke marijuana. That's one of my favourite things to do. Uh, you don't have to like it as well. I like it enough for all of us. <laughs> I used to worry if I smoked too often I'd get brain damage, ruin my life and, you know, become a degenerate. And now I'm almost never worried. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes when I smoke I have to do it outside because people don't like you doing it in their house. Uh, nerds. Um, <laughs> Sometimes when I'm outside an insect will cross my path. I like to blow smoke at insects. I don't know what it does. It's probably morally not okay, but it's, it's low consequence. No one's watching me. I don't know. <laughs> I just like to picture an ant going about its day going like, oh, I'm going to go get a stick. When I take it back to the colony, everyone's going to be like, oh, what a great stick. 
I'm really like, I know, I'm good at getting sticks. I'm an ant. Come on, mate. I step in, blow on it. He goes, oh, oh, no. <laughs> oh, how many legs have I got? <laughs> oh, antennas are weird. <laughs> I'm very small. <laughs> that shoe. Look at me next to a shoe. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, that one fizzles out. I, uh... <laughs> Escalators are only aptly named, like, half the time. It's the rest of the time they're descalating. <laughs> I like to think originally they were made just to escalate, but after a while, everyone was just upstairs. Like, oh, <laughs> this is not finished, we're trapped. <laughs> I saw a guy about to jump off a bridge once, so I went over to him, I talked to him, and I got him to change his mind. He decided he would still jump, but without a bungee. <laughs> oh, it's a shame. I know, it's a shame. <laughs> I've got a problem with a light switch at my house. Uh, every time you turn on the light, she flies in on a broom and goes, I'm the light switch! <laughs> <laughs> Frustrating. Uh, I feel like I laughed at that one more than you did, but that's fine. <laughs> I asked for a wake-up call at the hotel once, and the guy looked me dead in the eyes and he said, you're a drug addict and you're killing yourself. <laughs> I was like, and I was like, in the morning, all right? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm awake now, it's not how these work. <laughs> Also, rude. What? <laughs> I, uh, I was walking along once, someone told me my fly was down, so I turned to my pet fly and I said, what's wrong, mate? <laughs> he said, your willy's hanging out. <laughs> I like that joke, because halfway through it sounds like it's both finished and bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good at talking to women. I go up to them, I say, hey, my name's Andy, and I just want to be friends. And they always go, ah, have sex with me. <laughs> Ooh, it's frustrating. <laughs> I'm more than just an incredibly stringy piece of meat, guys. I... <laughs> I'm not very good at jobs. This is the only job I've ever wanted to have, so you can imagine how good I am at things I don't care about. <laughs> I tend to just show up to job interviews. They just see my head and face and go like, well, no, obviously not. <laughs> I think this is a water slide factory. <laughs> That's the only place I can think of where they'd hire me. <laughs> It's an office, mate. You need to leave. I don't know. I, uh, I had one job where something amazing happened every day at 9 a.m. Uh, I don't know what it was, because I'd always miss it. But <laughs> I'd come into work, and my boss would be like, where were you? You should have been here at 9. And I'd be like, again? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> you guys have calmed down fast in the five hours since. <laughs> uh, you guys have been lovely. Thank you for coming. Good night. <laughs> Andy Field! Uh, the BBC have asked me to clarify marijuana is not necessarily good, nor is jumping off bridges. Right. Uh, <laughs> I hope I have to do a caveat after every act. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please continue applauding. Oh, well, I've stopped you from doing it, but please resume applauding and cheering and welcome your next act, Morgan Rees! <laughs> Hello, are you all on good form? Yes! Sir, shout your favourite animal, I'll tell you a fact. Dog. My dad left when I was three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, anybody else with daddy issues in? Give me a hug. <laughs> it's alright guys, my dad left, but fortunately I had a stay-at-home mother. Or oh, its official title, electronically tagged. <laughs> Home was tough, guys, but school was even tougher. Because at school there was also a boy with my name, also studied maths, also played rugby, was also from my village. So to distinguish us from each other, they started calling us Fit Morgan and Morgan. <laughs> and I'm Morgan. <laughs> he eventually got the name Beefcake. I thought, great, no more nicknames. Then I got called Cake. <laughs> I don't want you guys getting the wrong impression, though. I am still quite good with women. Uh, for example, every girl I've ever wanted to sleep with, yeah, is now my friend. <laughs> that is how good we're... Joking aside, I am actually seeing someone at the moment. It's a very modern relationship. Uh, initially, we were just friends with benefits. Uh, but eventually, we've got, we got off the dole. <laughs> and, and then started banging. Uh, <laughs> 
I don't know whether anyone else here is like this, but I can eat whatever I want and still not be able to put on any jeans. Uh, <laughs> I even used to be five stone heavier than this. Turning point for me was when I got fired from work and two positions became available. <laughs> I said I didn't know you were expanding. They said ditto. <laughs> and it's all because food's my drug, you know, food's my drug. Uh, but my housemates, their drugs are, are, are drugs. <laughs> the way I like to put it is while they're doing the Charlie, I'm doing the chocolate factory. Does that make it <laughs> any clearer? <laughs> And I say, housemates, bit of a fib. Just moved in with these three Yorkshire girls. Ah, oh, they are such random characters. Uh, personalities, not strong passwords. <laughs> <laughs> but they're big oversharers, and I hate oversharing. They took me aside the other day. They said, Morgan, just to let you know, all our periods are in sync. I was like, oh, just put the dishes in there. I like that, you guys laughing. I just got one, oh, God. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I told you something personal about them. I should really do the same. Um, I, I got diagnosed very young, uh, uh, as Welsh. <laughs> I come from a very rural town. I think the most Welshy thing I ever saw was when me and my cousin went to the local school fete, and my cousin guessed the weight of a sheep right. <laughs> and he won the sheep. <laughs> and live, I, I, being outside Wales now, and especially here at the Fringe, I get the whole, hey, Morgan, you're Welsh, you're Welsh. Do you speak Welsh? Do you speak Welsh? Oh, do I speak Welsh? <laughs> My bee than a bubble and a come like. <laughs> Which is gibberish for no. <laughs> uh, can't speak, you guys. But, you know, I was a bad Welsh speaker in a Welsh-speaking town. And I grew up through my parents' divorce. It sent me really loopy. I I'm still banned from my local KFC for shouting, What do you mean this family bucket comes without a dad? <laughs> <laughs> I used to put my welcome doormat the wrong way round so the world felt more inviting. <laughs> but I just wanted to be like my father. And my father was really into hip-hop. But for me, it was a nightmare being a bad Welsh speaker, because for years I thought my favourite rapper was <laughs> Cool J. <laughs> Guys, that's my time. I've been Morgan Rees. Thank you very much for having me. Cheers. <laughs> Morgan Rees! <laughs> Cocaine is back! Please welcome, keep it going, welcome your next act, Jacob Hawley! <laughs> good evening, Edinburgh. Are we good? Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, my name's Jacob. I'm 25 years old. I turned 25 last year. And now, 25 isn't that big a birthday, is it? You don't expect a lot. I was expecting maybe cards, maybe presents. My dad forgot. <laughs> And I wouldn't have minded so much, except last year, my dad threw a fully-blown street party just for St George's Day. <laughs> Man, think about what that says about my dad. His son successfully exists for a quarter of a century, not even a card. But St George, who maybe didn't exist, <laughs> kills a dragon that definitely did not exist. <laughs> dad covered a cul-de-sac in Stevenage in bunting, right? <laughs> and I went. I did go to this St George's Day party, and I don't know if it's just the place that I'm from, I don't know if it's just the party that I went to, but this St George's Day party had a bit of a UKIP atmosphere. <laughs> and it may well be the place that I'm from. I'm from a very rough factory town just outside of London, but now, guys, I actually live in London, and I've got an arts degree, a vegetarian girlfriend, and an almost convincing concern for climate change. <laughs> Not quite Billy Elliot, but it is something. And I... <laughs> But I think it might be the kind of men that go to St George's Day parties that give them that kind of atmosphere, you know? The kind of men that like drinking, like shouting, but can't afford the football anymore. <laughs> kind of men who use the word skirt to describe women, who use the word women to describe men who don't like football, and who use football to fill the void. <laughs> kind of men who are into lad culture, right? I'm not really a big fan of lad culture. I think lad culture, when you think about it, is completely moronic. And even if you disagree that lad culture is moronic as a culture, you could agree it's oxymoronic as a phrase. 
Keep up, lads. <laughs> I, uh, I went to this St. George's Day party, right, and I got chatting to one of my dad's mates. I say I got chatting to him, he just spoke at me, right? He found me at this party, he saw that I wasn't having fun, he sort of staggered over to me and he went, What's the matter, Jake? Do you not love the Queen? Do you not love the flag? You're not prepared to be British on St. George's Day? <laughs> Troops. <laughs> and I said to this guy, I said, no, mate, I've never been to church, so I don't believe in saints, and I've been to primary school, so don't believe in dragons. Okay? <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of St. George's Day. He genuinely said to me, he went, yeah, well, might not have been a dragon, it could have been a lizard, he's still a saint. <laughs> so according to this guy, if you go around slaughtering lizards with swords, patron saint of England. <laughs> I try it, kicked out of Pets World. But, and if anything, that made me feel worse. I was like, hang on a minute, guys. So a few thousand years ago, a guy slayed a lizard with a sword and you're throwing a street party. I survived 25 years in Stevenage. Nothing. <laughs> and I don't know about you guys, I've seen a picture of St George. He's always got a sword and he's always on a horse. And you've got to think, if it was really a lizard, did it really require cavalry? <laughs> I mean, he brought his sword, he could have done it with scissors. He's pathetic. <laughs> I don't think that St George should be the patron saint of England, if that's the case. I think the patron saint of England should be Gary Lineker. <laughs> I'm a massive football fan, guys, because I too have a void to fill. And, uh, and I love Gary Lineker, right? I follow Gary Lineker on Twitter, and he's always putting really nice things about how this country should be doing more for refugees. That's something that I agree with. It's something you may disagree with. Even if you do, you have to admire such a right-footed footballer positioning himself on the left so frequently. <laughs> Thank you, lads. And I... <laughs> And he gets a lot of stick for it on Twitter, Gary Lineker. He gets a lot of like, weird men tweeting him things like, shut up, Gary, stick to football, Gary. My wife left me, Gary. <laughs> Troops. And, <laughs> and the most frequent thing he gets, he gets people going, Gary, if you care so much about immigrants, why don't you let them move in with you? Now, that's something I think is a bit unfair, because what Gary Lineker is actually talking about is our country doing something like, like collective action to help refugees, not someone taking individual action, collective action. And collective action is something that I believe in, guys. For example, I give about six pounds a month to the World Wildlife Fund to help elephants that have lost their homes to deforestation. <laughs> not all heroes wear capes, right? <laughs> But that's an example of me and the rest of that charity taking collective action on that issue. It's not something I can take individual action on. The elephant can't move in with me. <laughs> I live in a very small studio flat in South London with my girlfriend. Our landlord is very strict on subletting. <laughs> and the thing is, my girlfriend's always very supportive of the money that I give to charity, but I just feel like if I moved an elephant into our flat... Like, she wouldn't say anything, but there'd just sort of be this unspoken, awkward... <laughs> Thank you very much. I've been Jacob Hawley. Cheers! Jacob Hawley! We are at the halfway stage. Are you having a nice time? Yeah. Another question you had little choice but to answer positively there. Uh, but you have been a lovely audience. I hope that you are enjoying it as much as I told you you would enjoy it. Uh, your next act, once again, you're going to find very funny. Once again, I'm going to ask you to uh, just very gently... Be and because we are halfway through, maybe I'll allow you just a breather now for sort of ten seconds. So this should be cracking radio, actually. Uh, <laughs> I think if we all left the tent and no one at home knew what had happened, I think I'd hear about it quite quickly. Uh, so uh, please begin, uh, once again, uh, sort of uh, subdued but supportive applause. And then quite quickly allow it to escalate. And now, just because we are at halfway, maybe take it up even another notch. I'm off in the brilliant Heidi Regan! Hi. Hey. Lovely to be here. Um, my name's Heidi. Uh, I've been told when I do comedy that I'm a slow burner, so get ready for some fun <laughs> later. Um, very, very exciting for later. Um, but while we wait for the fun, um, I want to get a bit... Um, I want to get a bit serious, cos um, we're in very dark, uh, very scary times right now, um, and I keep losing political arguments, so I'm trying to practice uh, being more topical on stage. Um, so I've been thinking about Hitler. <laughs> um, specifically, Hitler as a baby. Uh, I know uh, women, we get to a certain age, it's all babies, babies, babies. Um, <laughs> And the Third Reich. <laughs> <laughs> what are we like? Um, 
But I've been thinking about that famous uh, philosophical dilemma. I'm sure you've all heard it. The if you had a time machine, would it be morally right to go back and kill Hitler as a baby? Um, I think it goes on like considering you could be using that time machine to go back and kill baby Stalin or the baby who started climate change. It's, <laughs> it's about choosing which is the greater threat to humanity. Um, like, you've got a time machine, you're going to kill a baby. <laughs> uh, that's what they're for. Um, but, but I've been thinking about, I don't think you'd have to kill Hitler at all because he was born in a very dark period of history that scholars refer to as uh, B.D. VD, uh, like before DVD. <laughs> L like before this golden age of binge television we're in now that began with DVD box sets, now there's Netflix, HBO, Amazon, all making these like long, intelligent TV series that are making humanity finally think about really big ideas for the first time ever. Um, <laughs> so I would go back and I'll get a young Hitler, um, like maybe like seven years old, like before he went full Hitler. <laughs> like, like a prequel Hitler, like a, um, what was Vader's, like an Anakin Hitler. Um, and, and first I would make little seven-year-old Hitler watch all the Game of Thrones. And I would say, now do you see the futility of violence? And he would say, yeah, um, or yeah. Um, <laughs> Then we would watch all the House of Cards, and I would say, now do you see how hollow is the pursuit of power, how it gets a bit boring around season three. <laughs> uh, then we would watch uh, The Sopranos, of course, uh, just because I've heard great things, but I've never had time to watch it, so... <laughs> if, I, if I've taken a week off work to re-educate Hitler, then, like, no time like the present. Um, or The Past. Eh? That, Hitler will laugh at that. That's one of those, like, you had to be there type jokes. Um, uh, then we would get back on it and we would watch all the Harry Potter DVDs. And at the end, I would say, uh, who did you identify with in that? And he would say, uh, Hare Potter. And I'd say, first, it's pronounced Harry. <laughs> you idiot. Um, and secondly, you've walked right into my clever trap, because fun fact, child Hitler, um, it's thought that J.K. Rowling actually based one of the characters in this on you and a lot of things you're going to do. But it wasn't Harry. You're going to feel so stupid. <laughs> it was the villain, Voldemort. You're going to grow up to be the villain. And Hitler will be like, no, or nine. <laughs> and I'll say, yes. And then I'll explain to him World War II. And I'll say, but it's not going to happen now because I have taught you the importance of empathy and good TV scheduling. <laughs> And Child Hitler will say, but have we done enough? Like, if I don't start this war, could another baddie not take my place? And I'll say, no, you're, you're literally the worst. <laughs> um, ju just leave the politics to the grown-ups, Hitler. Um, and Hitler will say, but I mean, was I just a symptom of the inherent anti-Semitism across Europe at the time and growing instability from economic depression? And I'll say... Uh, well, they didn't cover that in Harry Potter. <laughs> uh, and, and he'll say, well, just simply, what were the main factors in the rise of fascism? And I'll say, it's a great question. Uh, and I am going to Google it. Um, but I think in the meantime, I'm going to have to go back and just kill you as a baby. <laughs> And Hitler will say, uh, you're going to try to kill me as a baby. Don't you remember that Voldemort tried to kill Harry Potter as a baby? And I'll be like, nine. <laughs> I have become the monster. What were the odds? Um, can't win political arguments even when I've scripted them myself. Um, I, um, I was a bit nervous about talking about this tonight because I was worried that you guys would think that to joke in any way, no matter how off-subject I got about such a serious subject, it was very flippant and insensitive, whereas obviously I'm trying to use comedy to make a very serious and nuanced point I've thought very hard about, about just how bad uh, House of Cards got after season two. <laughs> so uh, we have to face this stuff full on. So thank you for going with me on that, and have a lovely night. I've been asked to say, don't kill babies at home.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, your penultimate act of the night, please give an enormous welcome to the excellent Mr Aaron Simmons! <laughs> So, Heidi was just talking about Harry Potter, um, but what she didn't mention is that in Harry Potter, all the wizards, they call the non-wizards muggles, right? You may know that. What you may not know, however, is that disabled people do that with able-bodied people as well. <laughs> we call non-disabled people patronising bastards. <laughs> I'll give you an example. Every time I am on a train, someone offers me a seat. <laughs> For the listeners at home, I am in a wheelchair <laughs> and not pregnant. Uh, I'll give you a better example. What is your name, sir? Martin. Martin. And can you remember the last time you won an escalator? Yes. Of course you can. Did anybody... Clap. <laughs> they do with me. And uh, I was running a little bit late today, Martin, right? So I was pushing as fast as I can just down the Royal Mile, and some guy went come up with the amazingly original line of, Slow down, mate, or you'll get a speeding ticket. <laughs> so I ran him over. <laughs> but I think the time I felt most patronised is when I went. I was at Euston Station with my girlfriend, right? And we were just on the platform, and this guy came up to me, and he said, Mate, I believe you can walk again because I am Jesus. <laughs> Which is a bold thing to say to a Jew. Not only is it bold, it's inaccurate, right? I can walk a little bit, and I was about to explain that to this guy, but before I could, my girlfriend went, oh, if you could heal him, that'd make my life easier. <laughs> I wouldn't have to go on top every night. <laughs> Martin, that's just a joke, OK? <laughs> it's not every night. Um, <laughs> she then took it one stage further. She then tried to convince this guy in order to try and heal me. Right? She did this by suggesting to him that he should put his hand on my forehead. He did it <laughs> and then started singing Kumbaya. <laughs> that is the angriest I've ever been. But I didn't shout at him, I didn't scream at him. What I did was I started to build up the static electricity from my wheelchair. <laughs> and so when he got to the second verse, I gave him an electric shock. <laughs> so he feels this wave of electricity, and he doesn't know why, and I very slowly begin to stand up. <laughs> I then walk away from my wheelchair going, it's a miracle! <laughs> now, I only know one thing that is universally true amongst able-bodied people, and it's this. If you see a wheelchair that is unattended, <laughs> you really want to sit in it. <laughs> you cannot help yourselves, right? And that is precisely what happened. So Jesus comes running over and he tries to sit in my wheelchair. Now, the problem with that is my wheelchair is very, very light, OK? It weighs eight kilograms. To put that in perspective, if you went to the gym and you picked up an eight kilo dumbbell, that's how heavy it is. <laughs> now, the problem with that is because my wheelchair is so light, is if you get into it too quickly, you fall out the back of it, right? <laughs> that is precisely what happened, and it's one of my favourite things of all time, had to see this guy lying on his back in my wheelchair. But five seconds after that happens, my train comes along and I realise that I've got to chuck this guy out of my wheelchair and get on the train. <laughs> that is fine for you guys to know. You guys know the whole story. <laughs> but to the people on the train... <laughs> It looks like I have just mugged a disabled guy 
stolen his wheelchair and I'm taking it all the way to Watford. Uh, I've been Aaron Simmons, you guys have been absolutely lovely. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Aaron Simmons, ladies and gentlemen. Just one act to go, please don't even stop clapping. Keep it going, keep it going. And devote all your energies to welcoming the final act, Sakisa. <laughs> Hey guys, my name is Sakisa. It's a very unique name. It's a name you're never going to hear of again. I've tried Googling it. Because uh, my mum's name is Merlin and my dad's name is Glenn and I got Sakisa. <laughs> I don't know what they were smoking either. <laughs> but I'm originally from Barbados. <laughs> a lot of people don't think I'm from Barbados though, mainly because of my name. They're like, oh, Sakisa, isn't that an African name? I'm like, yes, I am free now. <laughs> But if you don't know Barbados, Barbados is a very small island in the Caribbean. We're notorious for three things. That's sun, rum, and Rihanna. So you're welcome. <laughs> you are welcome. Work, 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 work. Welcome, completely welcome. You are completely welcome. I do love living in Britain, though. I love British people, because British people don't like to admit when they're broke. I'll give you an example. So I used to work in a pub. A lady came up to me and asked me for a glass of lemonade. I said, it's £2.90. She looked in her pocket, looked in her wallet, realised she didn't have enough money. So she asked me for a glass of water. Find no problem, because I'm nice. <laughs> Went and got a glass of water. She said, can I get a slice of lemon in it? Find no problem, because I'm nice. <laughs> she said, can I get another slice of lemon? So you want two slices of lemon? Yes, please. Then I see her reaching for the sugar, said, girl, are you making lemonade? <laughs> Kicked her out. I'm not that nice. No, no, not on my watch, no. But I just turned 30. Take it back, I don't want it. Take it back, take it back. I don't want it. Because I'm starting to think about serious stuff. Like, I'm starting to think about kids. Like, I've got a five-year-old cousin and I love her to death. But I keep telling her mum, stop listening to rap music in the car. The five-year-old is going to pick up on it. She's like, no, 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 no. My theory was right at Christmas. At Christmas, it's me and the five-year-old. We're playing Super Mario Kart. Her uncle is over here. He's playing with his new phone that he got. It's Christmas. We just finish our go at Super Mario Kart and go to the uncle. It's your go. He turns around and goes, no, it's perfectly fine. You lot have another go. She turns around five years old and goes, bitch, don't kill my vibe. <laughs> I didn't know whether to cry high five her. I high five though, that was funny. And she got it in the right context. She's smart, she's smart. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm the only child, my mom's really desperate for me to have kids to the point she was like, Sakisa, I want to find you a date. I'm like, fine, no problem. She's like, I want to use Tinder to find you a date. I'm like, mom, I want a relationship where there's love and commitment. And you decided that's Tinder? She said, yes, I said, carry on, because you know I'm alone. So I gave her Tinder and said to her, mom, swipe right if you like them or swipe left if you don't like them. So I gave her Tinder and for an hour she swiped left. Just white, 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 <laughs> white, white. Like it was a book of prime ministers, just white, white, white. I don't know, I don't know. I do find dating really difficult, though. Like, last year, I was having a quarter-life crisis. I dated someone who was younger than me, and I say younger, he was 18. Don't judge. Don't judge. <laughs> Don't judge. That's still legal. Don't judge. <laughs> but me and my best friend were trying to work out the maths to see whether me and this guy was compatible. She was like, how many times does 18 go into 29? I said, many times I let him. <laughs> I like simple maths. I like simple maths. <laughs> But I am single, I don't know why I'm single, though. I'm very open with who I date. Like, I like white people, you're cool. <laughs> you're cool. You like hummus and halloumi. You like, love halloumi. <laughs> Cheese that doesn't melt. Mmm. <laughs> don't understand it. In fact, the last guy I actually dated was white. I met him in Camden in London. He was really, really posh. Didn't even know who Beyonce was, thought she was a type of dog. <laughs> really, really posh. He went to Oxford University. Yes, I can get one of those. <laughs> Really, really posh. In fact, he invited me to meet his parents. And the first time I met his parents, he was telling them the story about how when he came down to London, he was mugged. I was like, babe, let's not tell them how we first met. <laughs> I'm trying to impress. Let's not do that. 
But the first time we had sex, his personality completely changed, like completely changed. Like it was five o'clock in the morning, he was coming through the door with a bucket of chicken, baggy trousers on, fitted cap on. I was like, where are you coming from? He was like, yo, 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 bop to the shop, golden wonder, what flavor, salt and vinegar, coke from my brother, flakes from my sister, 10 BH in a pack of La Rizla, dash out the shop, all in the zender, kick him in the teeth and pay him later, cause I got a tick on my new night trainer. I was like, I'm not dating white people again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Abby and Sakifa. Sakifa! Good tactics there, playing on the Radio 4 audience's notorious fondness for rap. Uh, we... <laughs> uh, obviously, for somebody like me, it's bittersweet to see uh, all these new people coming through vying for the chance to take work from me. Uh, it's exciting to see new talent, of course, but it's bad enough that a lot of my audience members now are um, maybe half my age. I'm 37. I quite often have to uh, explain cultural references that... I mean, I wonder who the youngest person is. Is anyone under 20 here? Yeah. Handful. I mean, do you remember um, I'm Too Sexy by Right Said Fred? <laughs> yeah, that's reassuring. I had to explain it to an audience member, what, it, what is surprisingly hard to put into context, really. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I tried explaining, this is basically a, a very sad song we used to have uh, about a man whose unusually high level of sexiness prevents him from taking part in a lot of everyday activities. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so he has to give up a shirt that he's bought, uh, <laughs> for example. Uh, he's prevented from visiting Japan. Uh, it's, just, it's never explained why explicitly in the song, but it's a quirk of the Japanese immigration laws at that time. Um, has to give up his cat. That's the saddest moment. Uh, uh, I've never understood why that was the case, really, because I've got a cat myself, and they run you through quite a lot of background checks uh, <laughs> to assess your suitability, so you think his sexiness would have been flagged up at that stage. Uh, <laughs> you can only assume, really, that he got the cat and then became sexy after that at some point. <laughs> Exploited. It's possible I'm overthinking the song. Um, <laughs> The plan is that in the next few minutes, we're going to announce the winner from the six excellent comedians that you heard earlier. I'm going to bring on now another alumnus of the competition. Having uh, done the competition in 2011, he's now a well-known actor at the Edinburgh Fringe and a good example of what can happen after the competition. Please welcome Mr Tez Ilias! <laughs> Good evening, Edinburgh. Are you well? Yes! Now, you sound delicious. Hello. <laughs> this is nice. At the start of the year, I moved out of the liberal metropolitan London bubble. I moved back to Blackburn. Uh, hashtag Texit. And <laughs> it was great. My favourite thing about moving back home was reconnecting with my family, in particular my niece and my nephew. They're adorable. Uh, my least favourite thing about moving back home to Blackburn uh, was reconnecting with my family, um, in particular my niece and my nephew, who <laughs> I think have made it their life mission uh, to ruin me. Um, at the start of the year when I moved back, I took him to the cinema to watch that new Lego Batman film. Spoilers, it's very good. <laughs> and I bought the tickets for the showing, and I turned to my nephew, he's three and a half, very important detail, and I said to him, uh, my treat, as opposed to his treat, <laughs> what would you like? He looked at the menu of the cinema, looked at me, looked at the menu again, looked at me, and he said, um, I want, um, I want a cock porn. <laughs> <laughs> you bloody what, lad? <laughs> I, I want a, I want a cock porn. Okay, um, I'll be honest. I don't think it's that sort of cinema, lad. <laughs> like, what you're asking for is quite niche, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and mainly, it's just mainstream stuff here. Like, a bit of Bollywood, but nothing. <laughs> nothing like what you're asking for. He starts getting a bit agitated, cos in his head, he's asked for a simple thing that's on the menu, but his thick uncle can't understand what he's saying. So he does that thing that all British people do when he explains something to someone, but they don't quite understand it, in that he says the same thing, but louder with more frequency. <laughs> he starts making a bit of a scene. He's like, I want a cockbone, 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 cockbone. I want a cockbone. I start getting very anxious. There's a lot of people around. It's a very popular film. And I'm getting paranoid because I'm thinking, all of these nice people are thinking, 
how much porn <laughs> is that man showing that child <laughs> that that child now has a preference? <laughs> like, listen, can you just cut that out for a second, yeah? Be serious, yeah? What, 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 what do you want? I just want a cock porn, like you give me at home. That has never happened. That has literally never happened. <laughs> literally never happened in the history of this relationship. Like, all right, you can't have cock porn, right? Final warning, you're getting nothing. Be serious for one second. No cock porn. Pick something else. I want a... I want a hot dog. Bloody hell. <laughs> if anything, that is even less halal. <laughs> At this point in the story, my niece is asked to engage. She's a bit older than him. She's eight. She takes him in the arm. She's like, Uncle, I think he wants popcorn. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. I didn't trust her, though. I'll tell you why. She came home from school in January, and she said to her mum, my older sister, Mummy, I've learned how to speak Punjabi. This surprised my sister, because the kids, the third generation, they only speak English at home. Also, she goes to a Catholic school. Where has she learned this Punjabi from? <laughs> but my sister's curious. She's like, OK, show me what you've learned. And this little monster said to her mum, my older sister, Mummy, mummy, can I watch TV, please? That's what she thought Punjabi was. <laughs> Someone at school convinced her that Punjabi was an accent and a head bubble, and she's taken that information home to her mum. <laughs> so when she's like, I think he wants popcorn, I'm like, I don't trust your translation skills, mate. <laughs> but then I said, well, hang on, just because you're wrong about one thing doesn't mean you're wrong about everything. And if there's a better allegory for modern political discourse, I'd like to see it. She didn't understand that point either. Um, <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back in. Did you, uh, <laughs> did you mean popcorn, lad? Like, yeah. <laughs> then, then why didn't you just say popcorn then? And I swear to God, he goes, because I'm small. That is so cute. That is the most adorable thing I have ever heard in my life. One salty cock porn for this guy, please. <laughs> I've been Tess. Good night. I love less. <laughs> Tess Ilias. Uh, now, the news is that the judges have returned from their judging lair, which means the decision has been made. Ooh, is absolutely right. Um, while they make their way back up into the sunlight from the lair, let's take a look back at the competition so far this year. After comedians, comedy writers and producers listened to hundreds of entries from across the UK, 60 budding new acts were selected to go through to heats in London, Manchester and Cardiff. We had chats about bus stops, my mum, she got really angry with me. She told me off. She's like, Catherine Mather, I do not like what this London's done to you. You barely said eight words to that stranger at the bus stop. <laughs> we laughed about lads on stag do's. Will suddenly perks up and he's like, my name is William, I'm an Irish citizen, can I please make a phone call? <laughs> Next thing, the stripper walks in. She's dressed as a cop and she's got a whip. And she starts beating the living snot out of him with it. <laughs> Please, no, please, please, I have a family. Technically true, folks, because his brothers were there laughing at him. <laughs> we even had a song about bees. You want to save the whales? No, no, no. You want to save the children? No, no, no. You want to save England? Too late, so I guess we got to save the bees. Each heat was hosted and judged by some of the biggest names in comedy who were very happy to offer advice to our new comedians about surviving the fringe. Accommodation, get somewhere to live. I didn't do that last year, and the Meadows is a dangerous place. Get as much sleep as you can. Just stock up on that sleep. Just rack up those hours, because you're not going to have any sleep for a month. It is very, very important that you don't get absolutely 
unbelievably drunk every single night of the festival. My top tip for surviving Edinburgh is vegetables. You need vitamins. I mean, you know, look after your body. Uh, get some sleep. Take care of yourself and see tons of stuff. Like, the more, if you're just starting comedy, the best thing you can do is just see tons of comedy. Past finalists include Sarah Millican, Lee Matt, and Peter Kay. Our final six were chosen from semi final heats at the Edinburgh Fringe last weekend. But who has won the New Comedy Award 2017? It's time to find out. Please welcome, uh, wielding the golden envelope which contains the name of this year's winner, Jethro Bradley. <laughs> On the uh, clipboard with the schedule, it says, keep them waiting a bit for anticipation. <laughs> <laughs> Brackets, two minutes, question mark. I, I don't think so, no. Um, <laughs> Two minutes? That's more than Dermot would try it and get away with. Um, <laughs> all right, as a compromise, I'll read the blurb quite slowly before... and, and then sort of uh, painfully slowly take it out of the envelope. It still won't be two minutes, though. So, the winner of <laughs> the BBC New Comedy Award 2017, taking home £1,000 and a 15-minute script commission with BBC Studios Radio Comedy is <laughs> Heidi Regan. <laughs> Heidi Regan. Uh, Well, after uh, boldly uh, devoting her entire set to the best use of a time machine, uh, <laughs> Heidi Regan takes the honours. Couldn't the judges quickly talk us through why Heidi came out on top? The detail in the writing, part of this prize, of course, is a, a script commission and um, commitment, commitment to the cause and a sort of beautiful... Um, uh, ..security in her own self, in being who she is. Uh, over to you, Hugh. Yeah, well, I, just, I thought it was a fantastically sort of confident set. And I also think it just took us to a very, very weird place, <laughs> um, which is what I really liked about it. And I liked the sort of the narrative of it. Uh, and I just thought it was great. Well done. Jeanette? Yeah, I think we, we love the writing, we love the distinctiveness of it, and the fact that it felt so original and unlike anything any of us have ever heard before. Um, but I'm nicking it, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I've just put some more swearing in it. <laughs> and we love the whole slow burn premise as well, that you came on with, with great confidence and made us really sit and listen and wait, and it was really worth the wait. Uh, Heidi, how do you feel in about 20 seconds? <laughs> Uh, you yeah, know, all right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think my brain's going to melt down, but it's, it's amazing. This is, like, very surreal, dream come true. Uh, I don't think I'm actually here, but it's sad. Well, you are. You're, you're here. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is amazing, because uh, my family's here as well. Uh, my parents are over from Australia, so wow. it's very... Um, oh. uh, Heidi Regan, ladies and gentlemen. This has been the final. Thank you for listening. Good night. Hello, thank you for listening to the final of Radio 4 Presents the BBC New Comedy Award 2017. I'm sat here with the winner, Heidi Regan. Um, when did you start doing comedy? Um, I started doing stand-up two years ago. I wrote comedy in other formats for years, like... Uh, sketch stuff and all that but um never ever dreamed or thought about doing stand-up because i was i thought that looked terrifying and not fun yeah. but then i did it and now i like it yeah I mean, it, journey. Was, <laughs> it, it looks like it was the right decision based yeah. on um so uh, given that what advice would you have for new comedians that are thinking about entering next year my advice is to start stand up um and give it a go if you're entering bbc i think it's good to i waited a year before i entered it oh till i've been going two years yeah. i think it's good to know what you're, you're like 
and you've got five years to enter. So, yeah, I think start stand up and gig as much as you can, and then enter and then when it's... you feel ready. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, where are you gonna put the trophy? It's not. It's not too big. Like it's. Yeah. Um, just hang it from my front door yeah. so people can see it when they go past. I think that's probably best. Yeah, yeah. that seems the. You don't want anyone coming to your house not knowing. Not knowing. That you've yeah. Won it. Maybe yeah. on the stairs as they come up. Uh, who's the funniest person you know? In your actual life. In my actual life. Actual oh, life. actually, it's uh, I used I lived with him for six years until just recently. Uh, Scott Pragnall, who I re- moved in with randomly, but he was actually in the final of this in 1999. It turned wow. out he'd done same year Josie Long was. He is the funniest person I know. There you go. Wow. Yeah. Um, and who is your all-time comedy hero? Oh, it's not Scott. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, <laughs> you live with him, you couldn't yeah, yeah, still yeah. hero worship him now. Um, I think it is probably Will Ferrell. For stand-up, it's probably um, Louis C.K., but for comedy in general, it's Will Ferrell. Pretty good. Um, yeah. uh, this is a pertinent question, given what you talk about on stage. If you could travel back <laughs> to any period in history and do one thing... <laughs> I would say you've covered this yeah, quite really comprehensively. Yeah, really covered it in depth. Um, if you could travel, I, I suppose I'll rephrase it. If you could travel back in any time to any time period in history uh, and do one thing, but you don't have to kill a baby or show it DVDs, oh. then what would you do? I mean, I have obsessed over the Hitler one. Uh, I mean, you can still choose that again. Yeah. If you want. <laughs> can I go with that one just because it's the easier way to answer that? Yeah, and no one's thought about it quite as much as you. Yeah, have, to be yeah. Fair. I feel like, like I've you, earned you've that. You've got a proper plan. Yeah. Uh, this is Harry Regan. I'm Mark Watson, and thank you for listening. <laughs>